Um, so last time we're talking about these uh, applications for vectors and we define this new uh, vector operation, the projection of one vector onto another. And we talked about how if we talk about these force application problems, we can think about these problems as really vector projection problems um, that boil down to like finding the magnitude of a projection of one vector projected onto another. Um, and what we observed was that along the way, if we did this strictly, our final answer was actually the same thing as the dot product in the beginning. Um, and when I left you guys with the question, uh, is the magnitude of the projection equal to the dot product? And we said we're going to kind of fill in what the dealio is there today, right? That was the cliffhanger I left you guys on like it was an episode of Stranger Things or something. I know, right? Spooky. Um, so let's pick up there, right? Because if that's true, that's a big time saver because the dot product's a pretty easy calculation to do as opposed to like doing the projection and then doing a magnitude on top of it. Like that's kind of a lot of algebra. Um, so here's the deal. So if I have two vectors, u and v, the magnitude of the projection of u onto v is equal to the absolute value of the dot product of u and v if, what do you suppose is the condition? There's one condition there that we have to have for that to be true. Uh, well, it's v that should be the unit vector, but yes. So whatever the vector you're projecting onto, if that's a unit vector already, we're in business. So let's prove that, right? So let's say we have some vector u, I'll call it u1, u2, and some vector v, we'll call it v1, v2, and we'll say that the magnitude of v is equal to 1. And what we're trying to prove is just that relationship, right? That the projection of u onto v is equal to the absolute value of the dot product of u and v. Okay, well, let's do this then. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to do this in kind of two stages. So we'll just do the projection of uh, u onto v first. So if I remember the formula for that, that's u dot v over the magnitude of v squared times vector v. That was the formula from last time. Uh, so the dot product of u and v is just going to be the x components multiplied together plus the y components multiplied together. And the magnitude of v is just 1. So I have that. Everybody feel okay so far? Okay, let's do that scalar multiplication. So this is going to be v1 times that dot product, comma, v2 times that dot product. And then if we want the magnitude then of that projection, remember the magnitude is the square root of the x component squared plus the y component squared.
Now, if I look at this piece, that's a product squared, right? Do you guys remember what, like, the quantity A times B to the N is? That's a rule from Algebra 2. How do we apply the exponent to a product like that? Yeah, so it's kind of distributed. So it'd be like a to the n times b to the n. So in our case, it's going to be v1 squared times u1 v1 plus u2 v2 squared. And I'm going to draw the square root here in, in a second. Oops. Everybody so far so good? I notice now that there's a greatest common factor under my square root, right? That that factor apply, or is, appears in both parts of that sum. So I'm going to factor that out. And again, I'm going to draw the square root here in, in a second, but it's easier to write the other things in first. Who remembers the rule for the square root of a product? This is, again, another Algebra 2 rule, probably from the same chapter. That's exactly right. So I'm the square root of each factor. And I guess I can drop the parenthesis now that that's the only stuff left in there. So here, the squared can cancel with the square root, right? And what is, uh, so when I square something, I always have to get a positive result, right? And when I square root a positive, I always have to get a positive back, right? So this should be an absolute value then around it because the result has to be positive. Do you recognize what this is? It's the magnitude of V, isn't it? And do you recognize what that is? the dot product of u and v. And the magnitude of v was just 1. So we're left with the projection, or the magnitude of that projection is just the absolute value of the dot product, which is exactly what we we're looking for. Oh, we did it. Would I ever ask you to repeat this? No, man, but this is the honors class. When we say stuff, we prove it, right? I mean, you could trust me, take me at face value, but you shouldn't do that. Always demand proof. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's do another example where we couldn't have used, an, used this shortcut. Right? That's probably a good thing to look at. And we'll talk about how I can tell the difference between the two situations. So if I read this problem, I know that I can't use the shortcut on this. Where, what part of the problem is telling me I can't use the shortcut? Yeah, I have some dimensions for my ramp. Essentially, we're telling you the length of the ramp, meaning that I can't call it a unit vector. Everybody's okay with that? Um, although I can write that vector in component form rather easily, what would I say is that vector? Yeah, if 10 horizontally means 10 in the x direction and 2 vertically means 2 in the y direction. So I got some ramp. 
and I'm going to be applying some force up that ramp, right? So the force being applied up the ramp is at an angle of elevation of 40 degrees and has a force of 100 pounds. So that tells me the angle of that force is 40 degrees. And the magnitude of that force is 100 pounds. So I can resolve that vector then into component form. Just doing 100 cosine 40 degrees, comma 100 sine 40 degrees. And then notice in the problem it says the crate is of negligible weight. What is that telling me? Yeah, that the force from gravity here is basically just zero, right? If that was not the case, if the crate also had some weight, I'd have to add the vectors f and g and then project that vector onto the ramp. But here, there's, I don't need to do any vector addition because it's gravity is zero. There's no weight involved. Okay. So what we're looking for is the projection of F onto R, or the magnitude of that projection. No shortcut here. So I'm just going to do this in two stages. I'm going to do calculate the projection, and then I'm going to take that result and then do the magnitude on that. So again, that's going to be the dot product of F and R divided by the magnitude of R oops, squared times the vector R. Okay. Um, again, you could turn 100 cosine 40 and 100 sine 40 into decimals. I'm just going to leave it all in the same, just in exact form until I'm ready to type it in my calculator and then just type it in at that point. If you wanted to make them decimals now, that's fine. I probably, I'm just going to pass because it's just one less thing to screw up as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so due to the dot product of F and R, I'm going to take 10 and multiply it by 100 cosine 40. So that makes 1,000 cosine 40. And I'm going to do 2 times 100 sine 40. So that's going to be 200 sine 40. And then the magnitude of R is going to be 100 squared plus 4 squared, so 104. And then the square root of that squared. And then we're multiplying that by vector R. So I do the scalar multiplication now, so I'm going to do 10 times that stuff. So that's going to be 10,000 cosine 40 plus 2,000 sine 40. And that's all over, I'm just going to write that as regular 104. And then we're going to have 2 times 1,000 cosine 40 plus 400 sine 40 all over 104. And then I'm going to want the magnitude of that projection. So I'm going to just type this into my calculator in three stages. I'm going to do this number, and then this number, and then the square root of that number squared plus that number squared in my calculator just to keep things manageable so I can kind of see everything I'm doing all at one time. So we'll start with that first one. So I have 10,000, 100,000, 10,000, cosine 40 plus 2,000, 1, 2, 3, sine 40, 
over 104. Double check my mode, okay? And then we'll do the same thing, except this time it's gonna be 2000 cosine 40 plus 400 sine 40 over 104. And then my magnitude then is gonna be the square root of 86 squared plus 17 squared. So I get about 87.72 pounds. And that's kind of the worst case scenario there for us is where we have you know, a, a ramp that's, or a, we're projecting onto a vector that's not a unit vector. But it's still not so bad, right? Um, so again, if we go and look at these problems, uh, sledding down a hill, 15 degrees incline, the person in the sled weighs 135 degrees, so that's just the shortcut problem. Careful on the setup, because it's downhill. Um, 46, same thing, 47, same thing, right? Negligible weight, except this time we're being pulled up, so we're in the first quadrant. Uh, 48, again, this one is different. Notice the ramp has a dimension to it, so there's no shortcut on that one. Um, and then 49 and 50, you have a weight for the crate, a force being applied to that crate, and then a ramp. So you'll convert these two into vectors, the weight and the force, add those together and project that onto the ramp. But it's still a shortcut. You can still use the shortcut where there's the magnitude of the projection is the dot product. Should be good. Is that okay? Just kind of talking through the what you're seeing here so you're not spending like five minutes on one of these problems, reading it, trying to understand what to do with it. Um, but they're ostensibly just like the problems in the, uh, in the examples there. Okay. Uh, the other thing we're gonna do today is section 8.4. So here we're talking about two-dimensional vectors in space, not outer space, but like in, in the XY plane. Um, so in this section, we introduce another notation to describe a vector. Yay, I love it. Another name for the same thing. Uh, here we're going to call that other name the IB component form, where instead of writing the vector in a row, AB, we write it in a column, AB. When Mr. Kulik learned this, he, we would just call them column vectors instead of we didn't have the IB component form to it. We just called it a column vector. The other one we'd call a row vector, but there's not, there's no real trick into converting them, right? You're just like the X is on top, the Y is on bottom. It's like all there is. Um, so the goal here, what we're going to talk about is um, so what we're going to be talking about today is writing the equation of a line, but we're going to do that using vectors, i.e. we'll call this the vector equation of a line. So remember, back when we were writing equations for lines, way back in Algebra 1, what kind of information did we need in order to write the equation for a line? OK, 
Okay, let's be more general and just say a slope at any point, right, would be enough. What else could you have given? I mean, you could have two points, right, where you have to calculate the slope from the two points and then do it. That was kind of the two major ways that you would have done this way back in Algebra 1. I know that was a long time ago, probably into middle school for us, right? Woo! Um, so let's think about how we're going to do this with a vector or using a vector instead of points. Um, well, if I can figure out how to take like some equation for a line, so let's just say we take this specific example, and I figure out how to write a vector equation out of that, maybe I can find like a general way to just write a vector equation, right? Because we know how to go from this information to this thing, right? That was like Algebra 1 stuff. So let's think about what we have here. If I look at the graph of this, let's see, I'd go 2 over, I start here, go 2 over 1 up, 2 over 1 up. So that's like what my line's going to look like, right? Everybody good with that? So if I take um, some vector and have add that intersects one of these points that are on the line and then I add to that vector any thing with the same slope as my line that'll give me a vector on the that's essentially representing the line right and we should also potentially want a desire to be able to go that way as well. Okay, so let's think about how to do that, right? Well, how many points lie on this, on my line? Infinitely many. So let's just say we pick one arbitrarily. For the sake of doing the calculation, I'm going to pick that point 2, 2, just because the numbers are convenient. And I'll call that point P0. So that's like a starting location for our vector. And then we're going to need a direction vector. So if we're starting our vector here at 2, 2, to get back to another spot on the line, we'd have to do that, right? Does that remind you of? Slope? Slope? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Everybody agree with that? So we know that M is one half. That's like the change in Y over the change in X. So I'm gonna convert that into a direction vector. What is the X component of my direction vector gonna be? What do you think? Two, and the y is going to be one. Notice that 
the number one mistake I'll see students make when doing this is they take the slope and they make the vector 1, 2, forgetting that slope is change in y, so the y part is the numerator, over x, so the x part is the denominator. Very easy thing to do. And we'll convert this point to a vector. We'll call that the vector 2, 2. So if we take y, or take our point, and we add our slope vector, that should give us our equation for a line, right? Well, not quite, almost. Notice that this is just a, this is, when I do this, though, like this is just a single value, right? That's just the vector 4, 3, which is fine. But that's not representative of like any vector starting at that point and going in that direction. So what I kind of need to do is I need to attach a parameter onto this. So where am I going to stick that parameter onto? The p-naught for the point or the v for the slope? The v for the slope. Oops, that's supposed to be a vector. Okay. All right, so notationally, there's still something wrong here, right? What is wrong with this notationally? This is just scalar multiplication. That should result in a vector quantity. If I add it to another vector, I should get what kind of thing back? A vector, which is equal to not a vector. Right? So that's notationally bad. So the way we're going to change this is we're just going to say r is equal to r naught plus vt. This is going to be our vector equation for a line. So if we go back to this, what we had, if I say t equals 0, I get the vector 2, 2. So if I go back and I draw this, let me just simplify my picture here a little bit. Ah, boogers, it's fine. I'd have just that blue vector, right? If I did t equals 1, I'd have the vector 4, 3. If I go back and I draw that, no oh, green is fine. I go 4 over and 3 up. I have this vector. So you notice that no matter what value of t I'm going to pick, it's going to correspond where the head of my vector lies on that line. Everybody's okay with that? But that's what we've just done. Everybody feel good about that? Okay. Um, oh, and it's probably worth noting that if I pick negative values of t, what's going to happen? I shouldn't say v there. Those are supposed to be r's. I get 0, 1. So I'm getting the vectors kind of going the opposite way, right? So I have things that can go forward and things that can go backwards. I am good to go. Everybody happy with what we've done here?
All right, let's uh, cement this with a concrete example where we're just going to ask to go from our slope intercept equation to a vector line equation. So if I look at this uh, vector line equation, can anybody give me a point that lies on that line? The y-intercept seems like a good one, 0, 5. So I'll make that my point vector, r naught. Is that the only choice I have? No, you could do like 1, 8. You could do negative 1, 2. You could do any points you want are all going to be fine. Notice the question is asking for a possible vector line equation. There's infinitely many of them. Okay. Uh, can somebody tell me the slope for this? Three, which I'm going to think of as three over one. So what would my slope vector be then? One, three. Everybody good with that? So I can just say that my vector equation for line is 0, 5 plus 1, 3, t. Where t is like my independent variable there. But it's really just a parameter. What do you guys think? That's pretty easy to do, right? Not a big problem there. What if we want to go the reverse direction? Oh, also worth pointing out, maybe before we do this next example, drop that in since I already halfway there. Um, is that the only way I could have written V? No, what else could I do? And I could write as like negative one, negative three. Or I could write as like, 2, 6, or whatever, right? All of those that are like equivalent to the same slope. So there's infinitely many slope vectors you could use, although they're all equivalent. Does that feel okay? Just like there's infinitely many points, but they're all going to result in the equivalent vector equation for line. Does this feel okay? okay. Worth pointing out that there's like infinitely many answers here, right? That's the, that's the takeaway. As opposed from going the other direction. Um, where there's only going to be one answer. Can you grab the door? It's going to be loud here for probably five minutes. Thanks, homie. Um, okay. So... What can I get immediately from my vector equation for a line? Slope, which would be 3 over 2. And what else can I can get? A point, which would be... So now all I'm going to do is write my equation for a line. You could do this using slope-intercept. I like to use point slope when I'm given like a point and a slope. I think it's just a little algebraically easier because I don't have to solve for B and then plug it back in. Um, so the point slope is Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. So if I just simplify things down, so got the X there, and just subtract the one over, There we go. Easy, right? Piece of cake. Like, ooh, there's a vector in there. It's really just an algebra one problem, right? You have to decode to get the slope and the point out of it. Now, is that the only point you could have used? No, man, you could have picked the value for t and plugged it in and gotten a different point. But like, why? I don't know. You could have, though. Not wrong. 
All right. Um, next thing we're going to talk about is given two lines, find the intersection. If, they ex if it exists. So let's go back to Algebra 2. If you have two lines, there's three possible outcomes that you can have. What are the three things that can happen if you have two lines in a plane? Intersect, Intersect once. They can be the same line. Okay. Great. Um, intersect infinitely many times. That's the coinciding lines where the two lines are actually the same line. Or the two equations make the, represent the same line. And then they can intersect zero times. And that's where we have the parallel lines. Very good. So Let's say now, instead of having like two equations for a line algebraically, we have two vector equations for a line. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to want to sort out if one of those two things is going on. What's true about the lines in both of those situations? Okay. What is the same, though, if they're coinciding and they're parallel? Oh, slope. The slope is the same for both lines, right? If they're the same line, obviously they have the same slope. And remember that parallel lines have equal slopes as well. So that's the first thing I'm going to check. The way we're going to do that is I'm going to take the slope from R1 And if I see if there's a scalar multiple that I can multiply it by to get the slope from R2. So that's going to be 1, 3 times K has to equal 3, 5. So K, 3K has to equal 3, 5 or k has to equal 3, and then 3k has to equal 5, or k would have to equal 5 thirds. Since these are different, my values for k are different, I know that these two slopes are not the same. Everybody's happy with that? Um, if they were the same, what would we have to check to tell the difference between parallel and coinciding. Yeah, so what we do is we would check to see if like this point from R1 is also a point on R2. If the answer to that is yes, then they're coinciding because if one point's the same and they have the same slope, all their points will be the same. And if it's no, then they're parallel because if they're par if they're parallel or if they're the slopes are the same but none of the points any point is different, all the points have to be different, right? Um, okay, since that's no, we're going to continue on now to find the intersection. So the obvious thing to do would be to convert these back into slope-intercept equations and then solve the system like using our Algebra 2 methods, right? Everybody kind of agree to that? We're not going to do it that way. Um, the reason we're not going to do it that way is because as we add dimensions, that problem becomes worse and worse and worse, right? 
because what does a three-dimensional equation for a line look like or a four-dimensional equation for a line look like? Yuck. Not really a good way to do that without a vector. So we're not going to use that method even though it would be expedient here. We're going to use the method that scales to whether you're talking about a three-dimensional vector, a four-dimensional vector, a five-dimensional vector. Still the same process. Everybody's okay with that? Okay. Um, so if the two lines intersect, we know there exists some point x, y such that x, y lies on R1 and on R2, right? Everybody agree with that? So I know that x1 is going to equal, oops, I can plug in for R1 and I can plug it in for R2. Everybody's okay there? If I look at this, that's just like scalar multiplication and vector addition, right? Everybody agree? So I'm going to add those, or I'm going to do those vector operations to write this as a single vector. So 2 plus 1s, and then 4 plus 3s. Similarly, I'm going to write this as negative 1 plus 3t, and 5 plus 5t. Everybody's good with that. And since these are the same x, y, 2 plus 1s, 4 plus 3s has to equal the vector negative 1 plus 3t, 5 plus 5t. Everybody's okay there. And if two vectors are equal, I know their x components have to be equal. And I know that their y components have to be equal. What if I just created system of two equations? Great. Uh, so let's think back to algebra two. You guys looked at a lot of methods to do this. What is the most effective method you guys talked about? Ah, I would use a matrix, right? What's the easiest way to use a matrix to do this? Yeah, you can do it all in your calculator. You just got to type it in and I, it's, it's not the determinant, but it's using the row reduced echelon fun, form function. We'll show you how to do it in just a minute. Um, so that's the way that I would advise using to do this. So my first goal here is going to be to reformat my system so that I can type it into my calculator. To do that, I have to get the variables on one side and the constants on the other side of the equals. So I'm going to subtract 3t over and then subtract 2 over. And then I'm going to subtract 5t over and subtract 4 over. Now, for me to be able to type this into the calculator, everything has to line up vertically. So the S's have to line up vertically. The T's have to line up vertically. Then you have to have the equal sign line up vertically. And then the constants line up vertically. Yes, jump on. Sure. Once you've done that, it's now in a place where we can type this into our calculator. So if you have your calculator with you and you want to follow along to refresh your memory, 
I invite you to take that out and follow along. If you just want to sit and watch, that's cool to sit and watch. If you want to borrow a calculator to follow along with, I got a couple sitting up here on my desk. You're welcome to grab one. All right. First things first, we got to type this system into a matrix. So I'm going to open up the matrix menu to find that. You press the second button, and then you notice above the X and the negative one, in blue is the word matrix. So you press the X and the negative one button. Inside the matrix menu, you have three tabs. There's a names tab, an edit or math tab, and then an edit tab. To type things in, we're going to go to the edit tab. It doesn't matter which matrix you pick. Mine, the first four, I've already had things entered into them. But that doesn't matter. I'm just going to pick the first one and type over whatever's in there anyway. So I'm going to do that. Uh, the two by three is the dimensions of our matrix. Do you remember which goes first, rows or columns? Rows go first. So how many rows does our system have? Two. Two. And then columns go second. How many columns do we have? Three. We have one for S's, T's, and constants. That's three. So this should be a two by three matrix. And then the numbers that I'm going to type into my matrix are the coefficients from my system. So the first row should be 1 from the 1s, negative 3 from the negative 3t, and then negative 3 because that's the constant at the end. The second row should be 3 from the 3s, negative 5 from the negative 5t, and then a 1 from the constant 1 at the end. So this should be what your matrix looks like. I'll give you a minute if you're typing things in to get that typed in before we move to the next step. Okay. Uh, once I've done that, I'm going to exit out to the main screen. I'm going to press second and the mode button. Then I'm going to go back into the matrix menu, second, and then matrix. This time I'm going to move over to the math tab. So I'm going to use the right arrow. And I'm going to scroll down until I find the command R-R-E-F. Be careful because you need R-R-E-F, not R-E-F. The reduced row echelon form as opposed to just row echelon form. Um, so that's R-R-E-F. Pick that one. And we're going to do that on matrix A. So I'm going to go back again to the matrix menu for a third time. From the names tab, I'm going to pick matrix A, close my parenthesis and press enter. So this matrix that I have tells me the solution to my system. If I read the first row that says 1s plus 0t is equal to 4.5, so s is 4.5, 0s plus 1t is equal to 2.5. So I know that s or t is equal to 4.5. So s is 4.5, t was 2.5, right? Yeah, okay, good. So that's my point of intersection, right? Wrong. s and t are not the coordinates S and T are the values for the parameter that I can plug in to get the coordinate. So now I'm going to go back to either R1 or R2, it doesn't matter, and plug in either S or T into the equation. So let's say I picked R1. So there I'm going to be, I have the equation 2, 4 plus 1, 3s, so for s I'll plug in 4.5, 4.5 times 1 is 4.5, plus 2 is 6.5, 4.5 times 3 is 13.5, uh, plus 4 is 17.5, so that would be my point of intersection. You can check to make sure you're correct just by plugging the T into R2.
3 times 2.5 is 7.5, plus a negative 1 is 6.5. Ooh, good. Uh, 5 times 2.5 is 12.5, plus 5 is 17.5. So I know that I have the correct result. There we go. Um, let's build a little flow chart to kind of streamline what we're doing here, right? So first thing we do is we check if slope vectors are equal. So that what we did is we did V1 times K equal to V2. So if it's yes, we do some stuff. If it's no, then we know that the two lines intersect. Everybody's good with that. If it's yes, then we need to check if the R naught from equation one occurs in equation two. If yes, then that's the coinciding. If no, that's parallel. Um, let's do a little example where we have to do this check. Um, there's not one prepared in the notes, so I'm just going to make up one right now that's like trivially easy that you'll look at it and you'll know right away, like, hey, yo, Mr. Kulik, I can tell those are the same line. But just like, it's okay. We're just doing it to illustrate how to do this. So I'm going to fully acknowledge that, like, um, this is, like, the easiest stuff that's ever easied. Okay, so So first thing I do is check if the slopes are equal. So I just do k times the first slope and set it equal to the second slope. And then solve for k, make sure that the solution is true for each component. I get negative 1 as my solution for k for each of them, obviously. So we know that they're, the slopes are parallel. Next thing we're going to do is check to see if the point vector from R1 lies on the vector or the vector line equation for R2. So this is just scalar multiplication and vector addition on the right hand side. So that's going to be 0 minus t and then negative 1 minus t. So I set that stuff equal to 0, or I'm sorry, equal to uh, the, um, to the other side. So here I get t is equal to negative 1. If I add the 1 over and divide by negative 1, I get also t is equal to negative 1. 
since those are the same t, we know now that we're coinciding. Which again, you probably could have looked at the two vector line equations that I gave you and been able to tell they were coinciding. I did not try to hide it at all. Um, but that's, that's how that would work. Does that feel okay? Um, when we talk about three-dimensional stuff in a couple of sections, we're going to do the same process. There's a fourth outcome for three-dimensional lines. Um, and this process becomes really not practical if you're trying to convert a three-dimensional vector equation for a line into an equation for a line. It doesn't really work in three dimensions doing it in three dimensions, you have to kind of do it as a vector equation. So there is no like, oh, just convert it to an algebra problem. It doesn't really work that way. Um, but we'll use the same basic techniques, the same basic flow chart. We'll just add another arm onto it. Um, but the steps are gonna be identical. So we're gonna check to see if the slopes are equal the same way. We're gonna check to see if, you know, like the difference between parallel and coinciding the same way. We're going to solve for the point of intersection the same way. It's just going to be three components that you have to check for instead of two. But it's going to be the process will stay virtually identical, just with some minor modifications for the extra dimension and the extra possible outcome. Um, this is where I feel like we should stop. Um, at this point, you guys should be able to do up to 76. Um, but let's talk about what's going to be due when, right? Yep, we'll talk about that in a second, too. So for Sunday, what's Sunday? The 29th? We're looking for 1 through 40. So next Sunday, we'll then have 40 to, 40, or 40 to 76 so far. Um, and the homework quiz, we're looking at sections 8, 1 through 8, 3, which I think goes up through 50, if you're looking to be prepared for that. Um, Again, and the, this would be next class, right? Whatever next class is, Tuesday. I'll just write that. For assuming no snow days or whatever. Um, again, reminder, this chapter has 122 problems in it. Don't get behind, right? Just like stay at, stay on top of it keep picking away. I would try to have, I would have tried to have 40 done, up to 40 done by now, to where I'm just looking at in the next two days doing the problems as they're coming up, so that I'm not waiting to Sunday and going, oh my God, I have 76 problems to do. I better clear four hours for math time or whatever, which is like, shoot me in the head and I love math, but I don't want to sit down and do four, four hours with the homework problems in one setting. Um, so try to stay on top of things. It will make your lives much easier if you're behind. Catch up, but don't try to do it all in one day, right? Like do some, take a break, do something else, come back to it, do some more, spread it out over a couple of days. You know, maybe you do math every day instead of every other day for, you know, a couple of days and you get caught back up. Try to catch back up if you've fallen behind. But the, hard, the hardest stuff is here now coming shortly from this chapter. So you're going to want to be able to really do that homework in real time so you're able to come back and ask questions the next day. Um, so I'm just, again, just trying to give you guys non-academic related tips to being successful here. These are like soft skill tips, not hard skill, right? Hard skill would be like me pointing out how to do specific math problems. Soft skill is like, how to manage your life so that you're able to do, be successful, you know? That's what we mean by soft skills. Anyways, that's it for me. 
Do you guys have questions on things? Not yet. You're like, let me do some of these problems and I'll come back to you. I'm sure I'll have some. And we'll do we'll do some questions before we take the homework quiz. So if stuff comes up on like 40 through 50 that you might not have started yet, we'll have a chance to talk about those before the homework quiz. Okie doke. So you should know like vector operations. You should know like different ways to represent a vector and move back and forth between those representations. Should be able to do those force application problems that we talked about at the start of class. That's basically what 8, 1 through 8, 3 was. Okie doke.